This is a dog boy. Look at that. What I love the most about being in the water is that I'm not on land. You know, particularly when you're going fishing and you're fishing in salt water, it's probably the last true adventure that you can have in, in a modern lifestyle. It is that unknown that just keeps me coming back and the ocean never ceases to amaze me of, of what you'll see and, experience, and what you'll feel when you're on it. Uh, I'm Matt Watson and uh, yeah, I'm a fisherman. I'm a fisherman. Goes back a while. I um, always wanted to be a fisherman, my whole life. Since I was little, I come from a commercial fishing family. And I, um, I did that and I always just thought I was gonna be a commercial fisherman. That all actually went haywire on a Christmas day when I got into a punch up um, with my uncle who owned the fishing fleet um, over a game of backyard cricket. And then I went down the recreational fishing route. One day when I was uh, out off the coast here and it was miserable and I'm sitting on the deck of a boat um, after doing 80 charter days straight, I thought I might make a fishing show. I just, the idea popped into my head and I had a crack at that and yeah, so that's what I do now. I always felt the big story in fishing was happening under the water, the bit that fishermen don't know what's going on and I just dreamed up all of these ways of, you know, filming. You know, and it came, my obsession became not catching the fish. I'd, I'd got pretty good at fishing, I'd say, at a young age, and I'd caught a lot of stuff. But now, then my obsession came capturing that, that shot, that un, particularly underwater shot of the moment that a, that a fish is taking a bait or a lure. You know, I think from the time I was about six um, was when I started working on my first boat. I found a, um, a boat with a big hole in it, a dinghy washed up on the beach, wrecked. And um, I begged my dad to um, bring it home. And he said, look, tie it up to the wharf. If no one claims it in a week, you can have it. So I tied it up to the wharf. And on the seventh day, we took it home, patched it up. I did a paper run, um, saved up and bought some oars. And then there was no stopping me. I've always um, had a real keen interest in boats. Um, I've had good boats and bad boats, um, ones that haven't, haven't been so safe. And when I was, oh geez, the ripe old age of 21, um, I drove past the Stabycraft dealership and there was this bright red beauty. And then one day I just couldn't drive past it and I swung in, traded in my old boat. And uh, that was my first Staby, that was 1999. I remember the first day I took it out, it was worse conditions than today, um, but I was that keen. And I came around uh, the corner out of the entrance and I thought, we're gonna get a hiding here. And it just started chopping through. And I just couldn't believe it. Like, it was night and day to any other boat that I'd been on. The Stingray, I called it. When I was 14, I caught a um, 525 pound Stingray. Yeah, so all my mates started calling me, calling me Stingray. Not because of the Stingray, it's because the Stingray had a big cock, see? So, so yeah. So um, my boat was named after the Stingray. <gasps> um, well, it wasn't called in 1850, it essentially was. It was a sort of a six metre um, hardtop and it just opened up. I could go further, stay away longer and I, I felt safe in it. Look, it's got like the sex appeal of an army tank, you know? Like, I mean, some people might say a bloody, um, you know, Ferrari sexy, but so's a Hummer. Uh, so right now I've got um, the center cabin 2750 and I've got side console 1450 and uh, the new acquisition behind us here, which I've uh, just started getting to know, we just started our relationship. Um, we headed out um, from, the, from the boat ramp on our property, which is a, again a nice treat. No queuing up at the boat ramp, don't have to worry about parking. Uh, we threw it in the water. <laughs> First time the boat had been in the water, uh, knowing full well we didn't have a sounder because it hasn't been wired up. Um, wondering how if everything's going to work and everything else did work really. You know, with the weather forecast wasn't great and not having a sounder when we're lure fishing wasn't ideal but, um, you know, it made me push around into the open which gave us a chance to see what the boat could do in the rough. Real happy with the way it rode. It wasn't, a, again, it's not a surprise anymore because of the stabies have just delivered, you know, so well for me. You know, particularly in the last decade, I haven't had one that I've got in and gone ho hum, And this was no exception, it just went really well in the rough. 
uh, and then again backing up into the sea, being able to fish, staying bone dry. I'm just like, you know, what I thought was going to be a tough day just because of the tough conditions turned out to be no worries at all. A few yarns, chuck a couple of lures out, catch a couple of snapper, and then of course that amazing trophy. Oh, that would have probably been around eight kilo, I would say. To get one out of here, a big one is going to be a mission. And without a sounder to know how deep it is as well. This is a dog boy. Look at that. It's a real fighting size. Yeah, always a thrill when you can, you know, pull one out like that. And a, and a good way to put some good mojo into the new boat. So, good start. I mean, the, the 1850s that I've had before, the Fisher, and um, my center console 1850, which I absolutely just love that boat. It just had good mojo, caught so many cool fish in it. Look at the size of him! Oh, there's a shark got him! Look at the size of the Marco that's got him! Holy! Just keep filming that. A massive shark has got it. That is the biggest Marco I've ever seen, bro. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Great. He's got our swordfish, and Marco has grabbed my big sword. Look. Um, I guess the, the biggest changes with this uh, one is a little bit of extra length, but um, extra beam. So the internal volume is just, it's hard to believe that you're in an 1850, there's that much space. Um, there's nothing that I feel like I couldn't do in it. And of course, having extra fuel as well. So it gives, gives me more range. You know, they've gone, look, people are gonna use this more. This is a real seaworthy boat. It's a bigger boat. People are gonna wanna go further. They've given more fuel capacity. And, and these are all the sorts of things, you know, yes, I do very particular things to set them up for fishing the boat, but at the core of it all, it's got to have good bones. And that thing there has got amazing bones and they've got all the basics right. Yeah, so um, 130 uh, Yamaha, so um, we were going to go with 115, which I thought would have been plenty. Um, but then, you know, when the crunch decision came, you're always going to err on the side of a little bit more power. And um, yeah, first run of it today, and it was, well, as, you know, I don't want to sound smart ass, but it was, it was as good as I expected. You know, I've got pretty high expectations now, and it, and it just delivered, it just went great. And people still say to me, okay, well, what boat would you have? Or what, um, you know, what electronics would you have, or fishing gear, if you weren't being paid, if you got to choose? And I say to them, well, 20 years ago, before I'd even thought of the idea of making a TV show, I had a Stabycraft, I had a Toyota truck, I had Shimano gear and I had Ferno Electronics. And I've got all of those things to this very day. Again, when I was spending my, my hard-earned cash on, on tackle, um, I had all sorts of stuff. Um, but I just found that the Shimano stuff was having to be repaired less and just had smoother drags overall. And then. I'd always look to what the professional guys were using, the guys I looked up to, and they had Shimano gear. So you know, I took my lead from my fishing heroes, you know, when I was a young fella, and, and that sort of steered me towards Shimano. And to this day, I just, that just doesn't let me down. Oh, so this is, the, um, this is Mataka Station, which is um, on the northern side of the Bay of Islands. So it's a um, property that I had an opportunity to um, purchase or purchased part of it about 11 years ago. It's a place that I used to look back at, look back at longingly when I was a crewman. And I always just thought it would be the best place in the world to have a house. And it's, um, it's what we've almost completed at the moment. And so this is where the first um, Māori and Pākehā, oh, you know, Europeans mixed. So the, the first, um, the first Pākehā child was born on this, this property. So yeah, it's, um, it's right here is literally the, the birthplace of New Zealand. We were about to just uh, run up and over now, it was actually the highest point uh, in the Bay of Islands. So um, if you want to talk about the geography, we'll just get up here and, um, and I'll show you. My, my third night staying in the house, um, I was having a cup of tea in the morning and I saw a marlin swimming in the bay in front of my house. Like, we're literally this far from the water. I'm yet to see a, a spot like it. And for someone like me, it's just, I really have to pinch myself. Um, 
but yeah, it's been a lot of hard work. I, I didn't really ever really wake up one morning and go, oh, I'm going to leap out of a helicopter or catch a marlin off of a kayak or a marlin off of a surfboard. In a way, like, there's no way I can make marlin bigger. Um, there's, there's no way I can get that thrill that I had when I caught my first one, you know, out by myself. But I could make it harder for myself. But I was honestly getting my first fish thrill all over again, you know, just making it hard for myself. Um, you know, it's like anything, you know, when the odds are stacked against you a wee bit and things are a little bit sketchy, and like, shit, you know, like, I wouldn't do that now. It's fucking dangerous. <laughs> The more successful the shows got, and I guess my profile got, the less days I got to fish, because I'm doing more promotional stuff. Um, and so it would come down to like, literally we've got to film an episode in a day, people are expecting big fish, and it was a lot of pressure. And I found I wasn't enjoying the fishing as much. In the more recent years I've gotten over that a wee bit, I've got, look, I'm gonna go out and do my best, you know, and if I'm, I'm not here to impress anyone. I would say now that the worst part is I equate now catching fish to an opportunity to film something to you know, be part of my job. I don't get me wrong, I still love it, but it's still got this thing, it's not as pure as it was. The flip side to that is, is when you go through the hassle and then when you get it on film, it's there forever. And some of the greatest things I've done in my life, full stop, are on film. <laughs>